Hello, everyone. Welcome. Uh, my name is Ivy Zhuang. I am a GRPC Java maintainer. And today, um, as Kevin mentioned, I will walk you through an overview of GRPC as an introduction. Um, first, a bit of a trivial question. Uh, does anyone know what GRPC stands for? Um, actually, GRPC Remote Procedure Call is a correct answer. And remote procedure call is that you can execute a, a call function that execute in a different process or even on a different machine over the internet. But that not that is not the only correct answer. Actually, G can literally stand for anything, as you can discover in gRPC C++ main repo that is every, uh, released every six weeks. And uh, golden retriever pancakes, named after our mascot, is also a correct answer. But unfortunately, the nice looking Google remote procedure call is not accepted. Okay, now let's have an overview of gRPC. gRPC is a general purpose. It can be run on different operating systems like Android, Linux, Windows. It can be run on different uh, platforms like x86, ARM, and it can be run on the cloud, on your um, web, or on your mobile devices. It is a language agnostic. We now support C++, Go, Java, Python, Ruby, C Sharp, to, just to name a few. And um, the core part of, is, of that is that it can communicate in a mixed language environment between kind of server. So that is really the core essence of gRPC. gRPC has tons of uh, features to make your communication efficient and safe. For example, streaming, high performance, security, and stats of chasing. And when I'm thinking of uh, the most common use cases of gRPC, I'm thinking it's really like um, a very powerful modern smartphone. So you can do asynchronous unary calls. That is just like email. And you can do um, like streaming calls, just that, that just like a um, video chat. And when you send a single message out to your mom, she might reply with 10 messages. That is a server streaming call. gRPC is uh, secure. We have different ways to do our credentials to uh, do the authentication, just as you can use fingerprints or uh, face ID to log in. And gRPC has a strong uh, native support for observability that keep tracks of your RPCs uh, within stats and tracing, for example. And that is like your smartphone is keep track, keep tracking of your activities, like uh, screen times. The feature list go, uh, goes on. So you can really rely on your PC as you rely on your powerful uh, smartphones. This makes, um, this features makes your PC excellent for building microservices. Now let's have an architecture overview um, as well as uh, familiar with those terminologies have refreshed on it before we dive in deeper into more technical details. So the outermost layer of the framework that closer, closest to the application is called a stub. Stub is a convenience that gRPC provides to the users to build your application. It's very quick, it is easy and cheap. Um, it is also really cl closely related to the protobuf generator code, and we can talk a bit more about protobuf later on. The next layer that uh, uh, the stub layer build on is the application, uh, the API layer. So uh, when you're using stub, you're actually indirectly using API, but you can also directly use API layers to get around the stubs. That gives you some powers because some of our APIs, they're only exposed at um, API levels. Some of our features only exposed at, at API level instead of the stubs. For example, you can do uh, many uh, flow controls on the API level. And channel is probably the most important concept here at the API level. Uh, channel is conceptually an endpoint that you can send and receive a message to. It is not a connection though. Instead, a channel manages multiple connections and then they can multiplex RPCs on it. Um, sometimes in API level, we um, correspond to a RPC as a call. This is also terminology. The next layer of the framework is the core part. So there are many interesting subcomponents in the core that an RPC will experience in its life cycle. Um, the first thing is the name resolver. So the name resolver's job is to find where the backend is and how to connect to it. It is pluggable. Next component is the um, load balancer. Load balancer's job um, is to manage the connections. Here, the connections, uh, we call it subchannels. And its job is also to find which RPC to uh, go to which um, subchannel. 
A load balancer is also pluggable. Buffering and retry is also in this layer. So buffering is that when you start request, gRPC not necessarily immediately send out to um, the wire. Instead, it might queue it internally because it needs to fetch other information to put things together, and uh, then it will send out. Um, retry is that if your previous attempt failed, for example, and then gRPC will automatically do a replay of your messages on the transport layer hoping that it will be successful for the second time. That will increase your communications robustness. Um, some of the security stuff is also in a core layer. Um, for example, the gRPC might be fetched some tokens before it is able, able to uh, establish communication or start an RPC. The next layer is called transport. The transport is kind of invisible to you, but it's important. It is just a lot of heavy lifting to put your bytes into the wire. Um, GRPC has many different kinds of uh, like transports for different use cases. Like if you're developing on Android, you might use an OHTP transport. If you are doing testing, you might you, uh, find the in, uh, the in process transport to be useful. And maybe in prod, you're using the NETI um, transport layer. And all those, they are compatible with the API and a core part of API, uh, core part interfaces. And in gRPC, we, um, the, uh, the transport is compatible with HTTP, HTTP2 protocol. That is important to make it high efficient. Um, we can also talk about more later on. And here, interceptors is interesting and a concept. It's kind of API layer, but it really gives you the power to rewrite your channel and a call. And sometimes gRPC will expose its APIs through interceptors. For example, OSI is one um, use case of that. And people also use um, uh, interceptors for logging purpose, et cetera. So as you can see, um, gRPC is really versatile in terms of how it's providing you with the building bricks to build your application. So we just mentioned that uh, gRPC is built on two community standards. The transport layer is built on HTTP2, and there's also protobuf. HTTP2 um, is an IETF standard. It is derived from the early uh, speedy uh, experimental APIs that originally developed by Google. It makes it, uh, uh, gRPC using HTTP2 really makes it uh, compatible with load balancers and proxies over there in the wild internet. HTTP2 reduces the number of TCP connections. It is binary. Um, it uh, uh, includes header compression. The, all of these features make our gRPC very high performance, reduce latency, and make better use of your resources. So Portal Buff is an open source project that does the um, data serialization. There are two major parts in Portal Buff. One is the Portal Buff file that is um, uh, written, that you write the uh, IDL um, interface definition language to write a contract between your client and server. And the second part is the Proto C compiler. So the compiler um, is written in C++, and it has two major parts. It generates your code, and it has major two parts. One is built in, the other is plugged in. The Proto C compiler uh, built in, it natively supports generating different languages um, um, for runtime libraries like C++, Java, Go, et cetera. And the other uh, plugin is an extension to the Proto C compiler that can pass and decorate your generated code. And internally in gRPC, we have a custom like kind of a plugin. That is how like uh, gRPC will turn your Proto file into the stops related things for you to easily um, run your applications. Um, those concepts the uh, like lectures kind of Boring, so let's entertain ourselves by looking at some code. <laughs> so the first assignment here you see is that I create a channel object. Channel ob by using providing a target string. The target string is used for a name resolver. Um, I also provide the credentials I need here for simplicity for test is uh, insecure. And then I will intercept, uh, install interceptor that will go through the business logic for every of your RPCs. Um, this is the API level concept. And then I will supply this uh, channel towards the generic the code to return a stub. And then I will do a blocking unary call here. So the block unary call as a stub will block your call until you get a response. So this um, is quite simple. Um, actually, under the knees, gRPC is always asynchronous, but the stub layer gives you some sugar to do um, unary style or streaming style calls. Uh, for example, the next example is uh, actually a streaming call. 
that you create a asynchronous stop, asynchronous stop this time, and you will provide a request to send out and also a stream observer. So the stream observer is that you kind of provide a callback for a gRPC to receive those messages later on when it receives from the server. Here, the callback, uh, the gRPC will uh, call your on next when it receives response or call on complete when the RPC uh, finishes and a call on error if there are except exceptions. <clears throat> so now we have more lectures. <laughs> So let's break down the client part uh, component, the manager, manager channel components um, to have a better view of the gRPC architecture. Um, here, as you uh, remember from the code snips, we just constructed a channel from, oops, from a target stream. And this target stream actually it looks pro probably very familiar to you. Um, to give you a refresh, it, uh, the URI standard URI, uh, the syntax is it has a schema like HTTPS and then column double slash authority slash pass. And gRPC follows this standard. However, it has its own interpretation of what it, the, the target URI means. And the uh, uh, schema, for example, is actually specifies the name resolver to use. And internally in gRPC, it has a map between um, the, the, uh, the, the name resolver name and the instant, uh, the provider of it. And when you spe specify it, when you are creating the, cha uh, the channel, gRPC will plug in that lazily for you. So that is how uh, gRPC make your name resolver pluggable. While the authority and the pass part uh, may have different meanings depending on what uh, the, the, the particular name resolver is. For example, in a DNS name resolver, which is the by default one, it will be a DNS uh, server uh, that you communicate with to resolve the uh, um, host names that you can connect it to as a backend. And when, for example, the schema is an XDS, then it's completely different. The um, authority part can be the uh, control plane. Um, so TLDR XDS is a gigantic name resolver and load balancer. So um, the next component is that um, the result of name resolver. So traditionally, when you use a UR, you are trying to discover resource, right? And the resource in the point of view of gRPC um, is actually resolved to address and service config. Service config can be a very powerful. It is JSON map. And um, uh, the most important part maybe in uh, service config is that it specifies which load balancer you use. And that is also how gRPC make uh, the load balancer pluggable. There's an internal map between the name of the load balancer and then the instance of it. And when we receive a service config specifying which name result, which the load balancer to use, it will just plug in to do um, its um, client side load balancing. And uh, the load balancer manages uh, connections, actually, we call subchannels channels here. Um, to de decouple the different system together, actually, um, the, the load balancer will return a picker to the channel. And then when there's an RPC, the channel will decide which uh, transport, which, which channel to connect to by calling picker.pick. Um, so uh, this is kind of the architecture of how things is happening. The similar channel is conceptually the HTTP2 connection, but we can talk more. The server side, um, as compared to the client side, is the thinner. There are two types of sockets. Um, the listening socket is always waiting for connection, and then once it is accepted, it will quickly hand over, uh, create another socket, child socket, to do the real connection. And this connection is what the client side load balancer creates and manages to. So we mentioned that gRPC is built on HTTP2, that is important. And uh, um, I think it's worthwhile to have an overview of the mapping between HTTP2 concept and gRPC, because I think it is helpful when you're running your application and doing some debugs and see RPC um, level of failures, or you're adopting some new features of gRPC. Um, so we mentioned that channel, gRPC channel manages a bunch of subchannels. That conceptually is a HTTP2, trans, uh, HTTP2 connection. And then when we're doing RPCs, we actually schedule those RPCs on those um, connections. And just as the mapping between a subchannel to a connection, um, here an RPC is mapped to a stream at the um, HTTP2 world of concept. 
um, in HTTP2, a connection can have multiple streams, and then those streams are um, delivered onto different frames. And gRPC wraps itself onto those frames. Um, visually, it's like this. So um, when the gRPC client uh, sends message to the server, it um, um, has headers and payloads, right? Here, for simplicity, we only include data, um, header and uh, data frames. So what happens is that uh, gRPC will um, send its metadata over the HTTP2 um, header and the continuous frames. Um, the header part gRPC will com combine your application's header to, and together with gRPC's headers and swear together. For example, the path um, header in HTTP2 is actually corresponds to the server's name and uh, method name in gRPC. So the payload are delivered in HTTP2 data frames. The data frames has its own um, like fields for like lens, flex, and a payload. Um, gRPC wraps itself in this um, HTTP2 data, data frames and has its own syntax. Here it has the um, com uh, compressed flag the message lens and also the message itself. Uh, to be clear, there's no strict relation in terms of the boundaries of these two types of things. So the GRPC will handle that. And finally, when the request ends, we will send a data frame also with a flag set, the end of stream flag set to indicate that stream is over. Um, a server side, is similarly, we use um, HTTP2 frames to convey the responses. And a little bit different is that uh, in the response side, you have um, head, uh, response header and the trailer metadata um, plus the response data in between. And normally, we have both header and trailer, but all trailer only uh, metadata, trailer metadata only messages are available, uh, permitted. Actually, if um, say you want to immediately close the RPC with only the status code, and in the trailer metadata, we will include the, the gRPC status there, uh, which is a, a product where it is a must. And uh, as for the mapping between HTTP two's um, status code and gRPC, so we can find in this um, um, short link in, in the bottom right. Um, that actually concludes my um, overview of gRPC. There are some useful links here. Highly recommend the uh, YouTube channels. There are some recent interesting stuff there. Um, yeah. Thank you, everyone. Does anyone have any questions for IV? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, this one. Yeah, this one. So we have a main resolver. Let's assume that I'm using XTS. Now, the client is going to have landed XTS. You have multiple pods running. So, and, and each pod has its own uh, services to plot. Now, the main resolver is it going to have all the channels connected to the client side? Um, nope. Meaning like, like the client is keeping all the client kind of, uh, all the server connections in the client side so that any request comes in, passes through at some time at load balance types, or is it making only one connection? Oh, that's awesome. really, this really depends on your algorithm in um, load balancer. So, for example, in gRPC, there are some built-in load balancers like pick first. Uh, even though there are many backends, it's only used the first re reusable one, usable one. And if it is uh, round robbing, then it will connect, make all of the connections and then select one by one. I mean, all so, of the, uh, the servers. So, if you have 100 pods running, it makes connections to all 100 pods? Uh, I believe so. It keeps the connection open. Um, if yeah, if if that is your name, what your name is, uh, what your load balancer does. Um, sometimes it does this. So gRPC sometimes in high scalable systems there are thousands of connections open. It's possible. Yeah.